everyone. Um, I'll just wait. I think some people are still coming, but I'll start anyway. So, hi, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here for your interest in my topic. This is actually my PhD subject, so I'm happy to see there's uh, so many people here. And also, well, uh, thank you to my the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation for uh, inviting me to present. Uh, for a second year in a row. So I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I'll start by presenting myself quickly. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm actually a newcomer. So most of you should not know me that well. So I'm an occupational therapist and I'm also a PhD student. And I live in Quebec, Canada. So I'm not from the US. Uh, I live in a city called Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean. And this city is, uh, if you know Montreal, it's a five hour drive up north from Montreal. And it's a city where's the, where the, there's the highest uh, prevalence of people living with myotonic dystrophy type one. So I've been working and uh, with people uh, as a clinician, but also as a research student for many years now. And uh, we kind of developed some expertise with this uh, um, disease and different issues. So I'm really happy to be able to share all of what we've learned so far with you and what we'll, we'll continue to uh, learn uh, with research. So I think that's about it. So I would usually like uh, go and I, I can't see you that much, but I'll try my best to have eye contacts with you. So uh, as you know, as you might have guessed, English is not my first language. So if there's a term or something, or if I talk too quickly, you can like make me a sign and I'll adjust myself. So let's start. Uh, the, I have four goals of my presentation. So first of all, uh, and the biggest one would be to recognize and understand the impact of cognitive impairments on daily life, especially in the DM1 uh, population. We'll also, I'm also going to give you an overview of occupational therapy interventions that can help overcome specific uh, difficulty specifically related to cognitive impairments. So the third goal would be to present you an overview of possible uh, resources that can help individuals living with DM1 and dealing with this issue related to cognition. And at the end, I would I prepared some time. So if you are interested, if you are, if some people would like to share their experiences with these issues, if you because last year my favorite part of the presentation was, was at the end when everyone talked to each other and gave each other tips and strategies to help with uh, managing daily life. So uh, if we could do that, uh, I would be really happy. So let's start. I just want to remind everyone that, uh, I know you already know that there's five forms of DM1, but um, the most frequent one being the adult phenotype, I'm mostly going to be talking about cognitive impairments of the adult phenotype. Uh, but you know that uh, the more severe forms like and childhood would be even greater difficulties and delayed onset, the, the same principle applies. So it would be maybe less uh, difficulties. But we're mostly gonna be talking about the adult form. Just so we're all on the same page here. Uh, I'm, uh, if, uh, I want everyone to be familiar with the terms I'm, I'm gonna be using. So activities are de of daily living or ADLs or everyday activities that for me, I only define it as activities of daily, uh, everyday activities that are meaningful to someone and are, that are important to them and that help them uh, realize their life roles. So uh, there's two categories of, act of ADLs. The basic activities of daily living, like um, could be uh, brushing your teeth, dressing up in the morning, um, uh, bathing. So these are all the ADLs. And there's also instrumental activities of daily living, which is uh, which are activities that are es essential to maintain your ability to live independently. And yes, specifically related to safety and well-being. And I would also add uh, to participate in the community. So of course, these activities are more complex. So IADLs uh, require more cognitive function or more susceptible to being affected by cognitive impairment. So we're going to talk more about these today. What is cognition? Not everyone is familiar with this term. So uh, the best definition I could find was that it's a set of mental processes related to acquiring, storing, processing, and using information and knowledge. So there's many cognitive functions. I'm also, 
I'm only going to talk to, to you today about some of them because it would take a whole day to talk about all cognitive functions. But just keep in mind that they are they all work together to allow your behaviors of everyday life. Um, that's pretty much it. So we know that daily living and uh, we know that DM1 can lead to many difficulties in many areas of daily life. Uh, for example, mobility, hygiene, nutrition, housekeeping, and leisure. That's a portrait we have. More specifically for the adult health, we have, for, uh, have the, a study with 150 people with the adult phenotype revealed that uh, half of the people needed help or were unable to maintain their home, 68% to do their major housework, 31% to prepare meals, and a little bit more than half to maintain a job. And up till now, we've always uh, put a lot of focus on the physical impact, what, what we can see. Uh, the physical uh, symptoms of the DM, of DM1 and how it can affect your daily life and the activities I just presented to you and the difficulties that can happen. And we tend to, uh, this is my experience as a clinician, as a research student, uh, I almost said researcher. <laughs> so we tend to overlook the influence of symptoms related to the nervous system. So, and even, and we, I'm going to go back, and we are, we know that in other diseases, in chronic conditions, Huntington disease, other uh, mild cognitive uh, diseases, that cognitive uh, impairments do uh, influence a lot of activity of daily living. So this is something we should also consider in DM1. This is a, it's kind of a hypo hypothesis we have. So we do not know a little about the impact of cognitive impairments on daily life in DM1. We do know. There's a lot of studies that document and uh, describe the cognitive impairments, but it's really the, the part about how it influences your activities of daily living that is kind of uh, unknown. And this can lead to a lot of consequences, including uh, less services offered to affected individuals. We tend to offer, for example, housekeeping services to people who we see have a difficulty, uh, for example, people in wheelchair. But it, Cognitive impairments can affect the ability to maintain a home, as we, uh, as I said earlier. There's also misunderstandings uh, from healthcare provider who don't know about the M1, don't know about the apathy, don't know about the fatigue, and so this can lead to kind of um, I, I don't I don't have the best word, but failures or difficulties in reaching our therapeutic goals, and that can also uh, affect your relationship with your healthcare providers. And last but not least, a uh, relative can be also affected by this because uh, some, I'm going to talk to you about this more in detail, but some cognitive fun uh, impairments really affect relationships and caregiving uh, uh, the caregivers, and they can experience exhaustion, frustration. And uh, also, a recent study uh, noted that patients and family report that CNS, and I'm sorry, I didn't the CNS is central nervous system. So patients and families report that CNS and cognitive issues are often the most troubling and difficult to deal with. So it's really important that we, we look at this phenomenon and understand it better. I said it's like kind of an invisible disability. So how's my rhythm until, until now? Is it good? Is it good? Okay, perfect. I'll continue my so cognitive impairments in DM1. Like all other symptoms of DM1, cognitive impairments are highly variable from one person to another. So I've put on a little bit more than earlier. Uh, and um, some of these uh, can be present. You can have some difficulties with executive function or have no difficulty at all. And same thing with all of the uh, cognitive impairments you see on this screen. Uh, but these are the most documented ones. We know that these are affected in DM1. I've included fatigue and excessive daytime sleepiness. They are not cognitive impairments per se, but yes. Would you like it? If, if, okay, no, you don't, don't write like crazy. I'll send it to you. With, there's no problem. I'll, I'll get in contact with the MDF organization. Usually we, we give handouts. But uh, you'll have handouts, handouts, at least online. Okay. 
So I was I was saying fatigue and excessive daytime sleepiness are not direct cognitive impairments, but they are related to the nervous system and they are related to your daily living and to other cognitive functions. So I'm going to talk to them about them today. I started to talk about this, but it's really, really important that you know that as DM1 is already a multisystemic disease, cognitive impairments, as all other impairments in DM1, are so variable from one uh, another. So I'm going to present to you today some examples of influence from cognitive impairments, but maybe you will feel like it relates to you or some, some other example won't relate to you. So it's perfectly normal. Just grab or hold on to what makes sense to you today. So I'm going to take some water. We're going to start with the most, um, I think it's harder to uh, understand the visual spatial functioning. So we're going to start with that. I'm going to let you read the definition as I drink. Mm. So visual spatial functioning is the ability to process, manipulate visual, uh, and manipulate visual, visual information and understand the spatial relationships between objects or shapes in one's environment. For example, it's the capacity we have to, even if I don't see the whole, uh, even, even if I don't see, I, I only see part of Diana's face, I can de deduce her whole body because I can understand that there's part of her that's behind my screen. So it's the ability for our, of our brain to uh, process image and make deductions. So it's one of the, I think it's the highest uh, the, the cognitive function with the highest prevalence in DM1. So more than 75% of DM1 patients experience visual spatial dysfunction. I would be curious to know about how many people know that about, um, among the community, of course. And there's, yes. So the person uh, just asked, uh, what's the impact? I think I understood the question as what's the impact of this visual spatial functioning? So I'm gonna get right to this. So possible impacts. I'm not going to say, give a lot of examples but we, because we would spend all day doing that. But one of the uh, things I see the most is uh, when you, and whenever people are doing groceries uh, or shopping, it's locating the items you're looking on some shelves. It's harder to locate the items and it requires more uh, energy. Driving, uh, judging distance between a, car to, between a car in front of you and identifying quickly road signs. These are some kinds of examples. We're going to talk, if you want, we can talk more about this later. Uh, memory. Memory is the ability to encode, store, and later retrieve information from past, uh, for example, past experiences or knowledge. So there's no consensus about the uh, memory impairments in DM1. The people, researchers argue, but those who have noticed in their research some difficulties, some issues, uh, noticed that there was a reduced performance in test assessing verbal memory, so the ability to remember words, visual memory, so the, the ability to remember images or that's it, images, <laughs> and episodic memory, which is the memory of our experiences, uh, souvenirs. So many uh, possible impacts, including remembering what uh, any list, uh, remembering what you need to buy, in health management, remembering if you've taken already taken your medication, you're not sure, remembering your medical appointments. These are examples of how memory can affect you. Next one is attention. So the ability to select certain information for further processing and discard some other information. Again, not a lot of studies, but those, uh, some authors noticed, noticed reduced performance in test assessing divided attention, which is uh, the, ability to use, um, the ability to do one or more mm -hmm. things at once, and the uh, selective attention, which is the ability to focus on relevant information while ignoring other distractions. So any activity that requires multitasking for people with DM1 could be uh, even harder than for someone who doesn't have DM1 or, or doesn't have these attention issues. For example, driving, uh, when you're concentrating on the road while dealing with your kids bickering in the back, or when you're at a big event like this conference and there's a lot of people around you having conversations and you're trying so hard to focus on what someone telling you, but it's harder than, for if you have DM1, it could be harder for you because of the impact on 
selective attention. Uh, I'm also going to talk about apathy. For those of you who don't know, apathy is a lack of feeling uh, or emotion or, or interest or concern <laughs> about something. So more than 50% of DM1 patients experience apathy, and it has been uh, shown that it's a predictor of participation in DM1. There's a lot of impact. What I see the most is impacts on leisure and relationships. Uh, because apathy can often be misinterpreted as a lack of interest and caregivers can experience frustration because of their loved one's apathy. Uh, what I've seen also is in relationships, um, couples relationship, for example, as DM1 is a progressive disease, uh, caregivers or part no, partners tend to notice that their loved one with apathy doesn't do the same number of activities with them as they used to do before. So uh, this can kind of change the, the dynamic in the relationship. And this has uh, important uh, impacts on the person with the D, with DM1 and the uh, relatives. Self-awareness. So self-awareness is the ability to recognize, understand, and con consciously perceive one's own thought, thoughts, emotions, behavior, and characteristics. So more than half of the among patients, again, experience difficulties with self-awareness. So this leads to a difficulty in recognizing the true extent of your disease and uh, the, difficulty in the, the difficulties in daily life. In social life, this can lead to misunderstanding, tensions, and conflicts. In health management, I've seen a lot of healthcare providers who are not familiar with the M1 having, as I said earlier, the, the kind of failures in treatment because uh, if they don't know that if someone doesn't recognize a difficulty, why would they embrace the, therapy, the treatment or the solution we're, we're uh, offering? So there's, this has a big influence on how we offer our services as healthcare providers to our patients. It's important, for example, to give concrete examples of what are the benefits of your interventions. So this uh, is important to consider. And the same thing applies to relatives also. And last but not least, uh, fatigue uh, and excessive daytime sleepiness or EDS. So fatigue is a subjective lack of physical or it should be or mental uh, energy. And it's to be distinguished from EDS, which, which is an overwhelming and persistent feeling of drowsiness or an irresistible urge to sleep during waking hours. So it's the tendency to sleep during the day. Even if you're doing an activity, you might be feeling like you want to sleep. So this is a, a symptom of DM1. So more than 50% of uh, people with DM1 experience fatigue and approximately 30% experience EDS. So again, it's hard to like pinpoint some specific activities because you can uh, acknowledge that every activity is more difficult because it's like uh, you have a shorter battery charge and it it may Im implicate that you need more pauses doing, during, for example, meal preparation, or you can't even complete the task because of these uh, the fatigue you have. Uh, also important to note that uh, sleep issues are particularly important because they are a uh, they influence uh, cognitive performance. The sleep issues can exacerbate cognitive difficulties. So they all influence each other. Yes. Yes, I'm going to explain it better. So when someone doesn't sleep well, or if, and that applies for anyone with DM1 or without DM1, if someone doesn't sleep well, it's like their brain isn't like at their top, mo uh, most best shape to use their cognitive. That. It's like in daily life. Is that a better explanation? And I'm sorry, I didn't say the question to everyone. Someone was asking about uh, how does sleep is a is a protective factor for cognitive performance. Is it better or oh, it per... oh, maybe I should have used another word. So it's kind of a uh, oh. sleeping better will help you function cognitively be better. Okay. Oh, maybe I should have. <laughs> yes, it helps with your cognitive functioning. Yes. 
cognitive function, I loved it. Cognitive functions will be better if you sleep better. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> um, I could have talked to you about a whole lot more of uh, functions. For, for example, executive functions are really important in DM1, and they are all the functions that help you do what we call goal-oriented behavior. So like formulating a goal, planning your activities, uh, resol resolving problems. So we're not going to talk to you about, uh, I'm not going to talk to you about that today because it's really complex and there's still a lot uh, of things to learn, but uh, maybe in a future presentation. Now we're on to the intervention, the possible intervention uh, for cognitive impairments. So for those of you who don't know, an occupational, uh, occupational therapy is a type of healthcare that helps people participate in the occupation or ADLs that are meaningful to them. Whenever an OT is working, the OT always considers the person himself or herself, his or her environment, and his or her occupations, which are the ADLs. And they all influence their, your ADL performance. So we have two kinds of main approach in occupational therapy. We can either restore, or we can either compensate. We can do both also, but that's between me and you. <laughs> so uh, as I said, we intervene on the person, the occupation and the environment. And uh, we have, yes, restoring and compensating. Uh, just an important warning. As you know, there's little to no research. I, I could say no research has been done about occupational therapy intervention specifically for cognitive impairments of, uh, in DM1. So I will be, what I'm gonna show you today is what uh, I've experienced, what I've in other diseases, as I said, like Huntington's, Parkinson, Alzheimer's, these are uh, interventions that have worked for some of these other diseases, but have never been tried with DM1. So these are potential interventions that could possibly be attempted with your OT if you're interested, uh, but a thorough assessment by an OT is always necessary beforehand. So, because each intervention should be tailored to your strengths, limitations, and goals. That's my, that was my little warning. This is my disclaimer, thank you very much. It was a disclaimer. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, we're gonna talk about restoring. So, we call this a strategy learning and awareness. So, uh, in this uh, approach, we focus on the person. We want to, we want to uh, reduce the kind of challenges by teaching the brain to relearn or, de or develop new ways of functioning. Uh, the role of the OT would be to improve the person's skills in activities that are meaningful but difficult to perform. And we'll do that by enhancing the use of cognitive strategies. So these are... Uh, uh, so the occupational therapist helps the people anticipate problems and to generate strategies or on his or her own. And we'll do that by different means, but for example, asking the right questions or suggesting to the person to verbalize what she's doing or, or things like that, just so we can help um, uh, use better cognitive strategies. Um, for example, if I say to my, to, to my client who's doing her meal preparation, and we want to practice this and make it even uh, more effective, I'm going to ask questions. So, for example, what do you think will happen if? Just to promote self-awareness, problem solving. Uh, when per a pe person verbalizes what she's doing, so verbalizing means that you as, like, uh, you name everything you're doing, even if it, usually it's in your head, but you have to say it so that the occupational therapist can better grasp what you're thinking, but also yourself can be you can maybe do it slower or in a more structured way. So uh, that's it. And we also suggest to practice activities uh, in different, different activities, but that resemble each other. So we can increase gradually the difficulty so that the person can transfer what she has learned uh, successfully. These are a lot of words, but I prepared an example. Don't worry. Um, uh, for example, if we have Lucy, Lucy, uh, the therapeutic goal would be to be able to cook a complex meal, a complex hot meal on her own, planning all of the steps of the task within 60 minutes. But we, we want to attain this goal in the next three weeks. So 
not in the next 60 minutes. So <laughs> the occupational ther therapist will firstly teach uh, Lucy one of the approaches. There's many approach uh, to do strategy learning and awareness. One of them would be the goal, uh, I think it's written here, goal management training, which is this one. Uh, and it's different steps like stopping beforehand uh, to ask yourself what you're doing, defining your task, listing with your occupational therapy, the therapist, the different steps, learning the steps, and then checking at the end if you've attained your goal. This is one of the many uh, approaches. So, of course, when the OT is going to do that with you, it's not going to take 10 seconds. It's going to take a while, but she, she's going to teach uh, the person the approach totally. <laughs> And we'll start by we'll start applying this strategy um, by a simpler but similar task. So we're not going to start right away with a hot complex meal, a complex hot meal. But we'll start, for example, with a salad because it's easier, but it's still cooking. And we'll ask the person to verbalize what she's doing, so we can, as I said, we can uh, follow her in what she's doing. Uh, the OT will guide Lucy while she applies the strategies. Uh, and we'll follow the step of goal management training. After the activity is completed, we'll discuss about the performance, what went fine, what went wrong, and we can and identify together how to correct them. And we'll try again with a similar but easier activity and so on. So that's uh, strategy learning and awareness. The other approach is uh, the compensating one. So it's called adaptive and functional skills training. So this one focuses instead of instead of focusing on the person, we focus on the environment and the occupations. So the objective is to reduce the gap between the person's residual the residual skills and the cognitive demands of the activity. So the, the occupational therapist's role is to determine which techniques or adaptation will optimize safety and autonomy in performing the activity. And we'll work on adapting the activity and adapting the environment to improve performance on specific tasks. So uh, the OT will guide the person to modify previous incorrect responses and replace them with new, more appropriate responses to develop what we call functional habits or routines. Uh, the idea is really learning by doing. This is what uh, this approach is about. So we practice, practice, practice a lot. Oops, no problem. I'm gonna, there's words, other words, but it's okay. So uh, in this type of approach, the occupational therapist likes to mix it up. So we'll practice a lot, but we'll also be doing a lot of other interventions. We'll adapt the environment or the activity to make it easier. We'll uh, suggest the person to use what we call external aid, so a cell phone. Uh, we have some behavioral techniques such as errorless learning, which is uh, briefly never allowing your uh, patient to make an error when doing the activity. So they never learn bad, um, incorrect responses. That's a quick kit. So it's, the focus is on what we call procedural, procedural memory. Procedural memory is uh, like your memory of uh, certain movements, like riding a bike. You know that riding a bike, uh, you don't have to remember how you put your, it, it comes automatically. So we focus on that kind of memory. And the uh, objective is to reduce the cognitive demands and make it more automatic. So as because of the practicing. So again, with my example, we have this time James. James wants to be able to make his, make his own medical appointments without forgetting any information within four weeks. Hmm. So what we're going to do, I thought with this uh, uh, scenario, we will sit down, me and James, and we'll break down the activity. So what are the different steps to uh, making your medical appointment? For example, we have to know, uh, you have to list all your, your medical health care providers. You could, I, I could suggest for, to James to add them, in, for example, in his phone. Or we could make a paper list. Uh, the occupational therapist will also accompany James in scenarios where he accomplishes these steps. So kind of make believe situations just so we can practice. The occupational therapist will integrate behavioral techniques 
such as errorless learning, which I just talked to you about, uh, and we'll practice. And as 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 it's not as long, but uh, when we'll practice, then times and times again, uh, uh, the occupational therapist will reduce his or her involvement in the activity. So at the end, the person can, has learned, uh, has practiced enough to do it his or herself. This is, uh, this is really a good question. It's a good question. I'm going to repeat it. Don't worry. So the question is, uh, she the, the person is like errorless learning. So she didn't quite understand because sometimes we would want the person to understand what she's going to say. So that would be... When we were talking about restoring, so the yellow ones, so we want the person to understand. Oops. <laughs> okay, so I'll just say uh, the answer. I just answer to you verbally. So when we're trying to work on the person's cognitive functions, we want her to understand uh, the um, why why she did the mistake, so she will not do it again. But this approach is kind of a compensating one. So when sometimes when we know that self awareness is not going to be able to be uh, what's the word uh, overcome. So then, then we instead work on compensation and making routines. So just so learning habits by heart. So that's the difference. But it's not really important that you don't know what errorless meaning is and chaining techniques. These are, these are just different kinds of interventions from occupational therapists that they know of and they can help you with. Uh, they know that. You don't have to know that. <laughs> And as I said earlier, uh, these are just two main approaches, but the occupational therapist has a big, big box tool. Box tools? <laughs> toolbox! Thank you so much! So a big toolbox and has many other uh, areas of intervention and we'll kind of mix it up and try something. It won't work, try something else. So uh, there's many more to this. There's also, I couldn't talk about intervention on functional impairments without talking about other healthcare providers. Uh, occupational therapists are just one part of the, uh, um, the treatments. There's, of course, neuropsychologists who, who are the experts in the relationship between the brain and your behavior. And they also can give, for example, cognitive rehabilitation treatments uh, that are tailored to your uh, your strengths and weaknesses. There's uh, social workers that can uh, provide support because of all the um, uh, emotional difficulties that can be uh, created by cognitive difficulties. So social workers can link you with community resources, support groups, and services. And also psychologists talk about these issues and how you're dealing with, uh, with it and medication management. Available resources and tools. Gonna check my. Oh, I talk a lot. <laughs> mm. Okay, it's almost done. So um, we're working on some tools that can be easily accessible. Like for example, we've been working on this leaflet. To uh, it's not done yet, so I I won't be able to share it with you. But it's gonna come, and we'll make sure you get uh, information about this if you want. So it's a, some kinds of leaflets for specific. ADLs that we know are difficult to give people with DM1 and caregivers uh, some tips on how to uh, accomplish the activity. So this one is about challenges challenges in meal preparation, and it's the different steps that you have to do to uh, uh, to do a meal. <laughs> uh, another uh, resource that was interesting is the guide of the, the MDF guide to for adults affected. Uh, by the juvenile onset of myotonic dystrophy and their caregivers. They have a whole section about uh, psychological and social considerations. So if you don't know about this, uh, you should go look into it. And that's it, because <laughs> cognitive uh, impairment uh, in DM1, as you know, has not been quite uh, documented that much. We don't know about this. So I think in the future, it, it's gaining more and more interest. So you're going to hear a lot more about this. Uh, I think that 
uh, there's emerging technologies like virtual reality that could come in handy in this kind of uh, treatments. Uh, my PhD research uh, is, is about to start. So my goal will be to better understand uh, cognitive impairments in DM1, uh, its impact on the life, um, and understanding it, uh, of course, how I see it as an occupational therapist, but also how, how patients experience this, experience this, also caregivers and healthcare providers. So I'm going to do, for example, interviews. And uh, that's pretty much it. And I think that better understanding these issues and the, because today I presented you possible influences, but it's not, it hasn't been uh, tested yet. So when we understand better the portrait, or, or what activities are the most difficult or what kind of impairments are the most present, then this is how, when, this is how we're going to be able to make better interventions and treatments uh, for you guys. So uh, the last part, if you want, I, I think the, I don't know what time the lunch is, but if we have time, I would really love to, of course, answer your questions if you have more and um, uh, talk to you. Uh, before, I'm going to just show you my references. I'm going to say again, thank you for attending. And if you want to talk more about it, I'm here. So thank you very much for being here today.